So at the end of glycolysis, we ended up with uh, pairs of several things. We had two molecules of ATP net. We had two NADH molecules that were reduced from NAD+. And we had two molecules of pyruvate. Okay? And so we're going to see what happens with those three products as we go through the rest of this pathway. But the ones we're going to focus on today are going to be the pair of pyruvate molecules and what happens to them. So at a very brief summary is we can take the molecule of pyruvate and oxidatively decarboxylate it. Now it sounds complicated, but it's not. It's removing one carbon in the form of CO2 and at the same time oxidizing the carbons that remain. So if you cut off one carbon from pyruvate, you're left with two carbons and it's in an aldehyde stage at that point. We're gonna oxidize it once to a carboxylic acid and then we'll finally attach it to a carrier molecule, in our case, coenzyme A and then we make an acetyl-CoA molecule. That molecule is the entry point to our citric acid cycle. So the first complex we're gonna talk about, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, links the pathways of glycolysis and citric acid cycle. Okay, so to, to prepare for that, we need to first look at some of these molecules and carriers that we're gonna be involved with. So the first one we'll look at here is called acetyl-coenzyme A or acetyl-CoA or more importantly, the CoA part of it, the part that's in black on the screen. And I think we've looked at this molecule once before. It's an adenine ring at the top, connected to a ribose, connected to a three phosphates, uh, to a mintandem. And then we have this pantothenic acid group, and at the very end, the business end of the molecule is a sulfur. Okay, attached to the sulfur is what our cargo is, an, an acyl group. In this case, it's only two carbons long, so we can call it an acetyl group. Okay, so you may see this written as simply uh, CoA or coenzyme A or just acetyl CoA. Right? Sometimes they'll show the sulfur, sometimes they won't. Okay? Um, another source of information to help you study is a, a link here for Dr. Michael Palmer's page at the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. And if you look, click on this, his link here, or this link here, it takes you to this website that has all the pathways that we're going to study and more laid out with a different point of view than this one. So if you need to see it a different way with different drawings and someone else explaining it other than me, the more ways you hear it, the better. If it helps you study, here's another useful link for you to use. And so we're gonna make this molecule from pyruvate. Okay, so we're connecting the very end of glycolysis, our pyruvate product, to the very beginning, if you wanna call it a beginning, of the citric acid cycle or an entry point into a cycle and that is acetyl-CoA. So we're going to convert pyruvate into acetyl-CoA and the enzyme that does that is called pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Right? It's a very large enzyme, has many parts. Right? There's three functional parts of it, three enzymes in this complex. Um, number one is the, the tidular enzyme that gives you the, the name of the complex and the other two are accessory enzymes that we need to complete the process. And of course it has some cofactors or coenzymes in there and we'll talk about five of the important ones that's involved. Okay, so looking on the right, I have a little diagram here that explains what we've done and where we're going. We've already discussed glycolysis, the conversion of glucose into, in fact, a pair of pyruvates, but it's just showing the chemistry here, so pyruvate. What's in the, the box then area is what this enzyme accomplishes. It converts pyruvate with its three carbons, losing one of the CO2s, losing a pair of electrons, that's an oxidation event, to make the two carbon acetate group now attached to CoA. And that is the entry point into our citric acid cycle, which is ultimately gonna oxidize those remaining carbons all the way to CO2s. And at the same time, oxidizing it, loss of CO2, we extract some electrons. That's the eight electrons you see leaving the cycle. They're not all leaving at one point. That's not accurate but a total of eight electrons from four reactions will take place. It will leave the cycle. We also generate a molecule of an ATP equivalent or a GTP, depending if you're in a eukaryote or prokaryote, but you still get a GTP or an ATP equivalent out of the cycle. So that's where we've started today with pyruvate and we'll end with acetyl-CoA entering the citric acid cycle and then we'll discuss the cycle. Okay, so let's focus on this complex that is the middleman between these two. It's a huge complex. It accomplishes a lot of chemistry, right? It's got three main enzymes in it. We call them E1, E2, and E3. 
Very simple. The first one does the bulk of the work. It does the actual pyruvate dehydrogenase function, right? It oxidizes pyruvate and decarboxylates it. And E2 and E3 are accessory enzymes that help E1 get back to the state it was when we started. In other words, we have to regenerate the enzyme. That's what E2 and E3 are going to help accomplish. Okay. So let's look at some of these parts. E1, if you notice in the table up there, has 24 chains. So it's definitely a quaternary structure enzyme. And it's not a, a dimer or a trimer. It's a 24-mer. And it's got 24 different parts, 24 protein chains that come together. Uh, E2 is a similar. It's got 24 separate chains that come together. And E3, still large but smaller than the other two, has 12 chains that come together. Right? So this is an enormous complex. Some of the cofactors involved are TPP, which stands for thiamine pyrophosphate. We'll look at its structure in just a minute. Lipoamide, which is another cofactor. We're going to look at its structure. And FAD, we've seen this one before. We talked about it last time when we were discussing all the different cofactors that were there, like NAD and FAD and CoA. So this accounts for three of the cofactors, and the other two you've already seen. CoA, we did on the previous slide. And NAD, we did previously during our discussion of coenzymes in general. So what do these things carry for me, if you remember? Well, FAD and NAD plus carry electrons for me. And the other three things, the thiamine pyrophosphate, or TPP, the lipoamide, and the CoA, are all useful for carrying carbons. Right? They're going to carry the carbon skeleton along for me. So we can put these into two groups. They're going to carry the, the carbon skeleton for me. That's the TPP and the lipoamide and CoA. And then the two other cofactors, FAD and NAD+, are going to carry away the electrons for me. So where is this taking place? Well, we said last time that glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm entirely. And the citric acid cycle takes place entirely inside the mitochondria, in the matrix of the mitochondria. So a little anatomy of a mitochondria in there. They have two membranes. So the very outer area is, is the cytoplasm. If I cross the first barrier, that's called the outer mitochondrial membrane, shown in blue in the diagram. It's a very small membrane. It's, it's got some holes in it. It's not watertight, so things can pass rather easily through it. In between that membrane and the next barrier, the inner mitochondrial membrane, is a space. So we have this space between these two membranes. It's called the intermembrane space. Makes sense. And then the inner membrane is watertight, right? So this one, nothing can go through without permission or a channel or some kind of way to get across the membrane. So we have a barrier that's important here. And we'll see this is the important barrier we're going to talk about the rest of the day. Inside that barrier is the matrix or the interior of the mitochondria, right? So this is another space and it's the interior that has the mitochondria's DNA, all the enzymes that are in there, the ribosomes that are in there, everything that the mitochondrion would have needed had it been a free living organism. It's now a organelle that's part of a association with the cell. It's kind of totally dependent on the cell now, as is the cell dependent on it. So if we look at where these take place, our glycolysis took place on the outside, out in the cytoplasm. In order to do the citric acid cycle, which is in the matrix area, I'm going to have to cross this inner mitochondrial membrane. Crossing the outer one is simple. There's holes in it. We can go through. So the pyruvate has no issue there. But the pyruvate cannot cross the inner mitochondrial membrane without help. And we're actually going to do this in a way that we take the pyruvate from the outside and do the chemistry we're going to do with this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, lose the CO2 and oxidize it, and transfer it across the membrane at the same time. That's why this is such a huge complex. It has to span the membrane. Right? And then on the inside, we're going to release it, the two carbons that remain, to a molecule of CoA to carry it away. So we make an acetyl CoA. Okay? Again, this complex, as I said, was very large. It's around 4 to 10 million Daltons, right? And a Dalton represents a, a unit of measurement like a hydrogen atom, so it's a gram per mole. So this is an enormous complex. Okay? The five cofactors that were involved, is we've seen the, the structure of three of them already. We looked at FAD before, we've looked at NAD before, and we just looked at CoA at the beginning of these slides. So the latter two are something you haven't seen before. So the, they're drawn here at the bottom. So TPP, thiamine pyrophosphate, is made from thiamine, which is also known as vitamin B1. And all we've added to it is a pair of phosphates. 
So when you get vitamin B1 in your diet, because you can't synthesize it, other organisms can, but humans cannot. So we need it in our diet as a vitamin, as a supplement. So we get B1 in our diet, thiamine, and we subsequently put a pair of phosphates on it to make it the functional cofactor. Okay. The other molecule on the right is lipoic acid, which is also one of our, our coenzymes for this reaction. And what it does is we have a normal eight, chain, eight carbon fatty acid there, so an octanoic acid. And on carbons number six and eight, if you count down the carbons, number six and eight, we've put sulfurs on there. Okay, so we've put a sulfur on number six, we put a sulfur on number eight, and then we make it into a ring. Right, so we have a five-membered ring with two sulfurs in it now. So that's the lipoic acid. Both of these cofactors, along with CoA, their job was to carry the carbon around. Right, so we're going to see where could we carry a carbon on these things. Right? Right, so let's look at the overall procedure, see how these, these different cofactors play their roles, and look at each step in the process. So at the top is a very rudimentary diagram of how this takes place. It's not reality. It's just to give you an idea of the steps that are going to take place. Okay? So these aren't necessarily the, the time steps or the, the, it is the order, but it's not necessarily the intermediates that are going to be created. You'll see. So we start with pyruvate on the left, and the first step is decarboxylation. It will decarboxylate the pyruvate. So you see the carbon number one, the carboxyl group leaves as CO2, and that leaves behind a carbanion. Right? And it can't be released as a carbanion, of course. It's not going to exist exactly like that. It's going to be held by a carrier. Right? And that's going to be our TPP. But just showing you the, the molecule, of, we're tracking the carbons from the pyruvate. And at some point, we need to remove some electrons from this carbanion. So we remove a pair of electrons. We tend to remove electrons in pairs to, to not generate radicals whenever possible. So if I have a negatively charged carbon and I remove two electrons from it, it's now going to be a carbocation. It's going to have a positive charge. Right? And it doesn't exist like this as well. It's still going to be attached to a carrier, to our, our lipoamide at this point. And then we finally transfer these two carbons that has been oxidized, it's lost two electrons, onto a molecule of CoA on its sulfur. That's the business end of CoA. That's why it's written as just S-CoA. And I've made an acetyl-CoA molecule. What's not shown in this little scheme here is we went from one side of the inner mitochondrial membrane to the other. We went from outside to inside. Okay, so it crosses the membrane at the same time. This reaction is considered completely irreversible. Can anybody guess why you think this thing would be completely, without a doubt, irreversible? So which of those yeah, steps about the, uh, the release of carbon dioxide? Yes. Or carbon dioxide in the gaseous state, if a reaction releases gas, then it's irreversible? So be careful saying it's not necessarily a gas, mm -hmm. because it's immediately going to interact with water and form a, a soluble molecule. But your release of CO2 is the irreversible part of this. Not because it's necessarily a gas which would be bad if it was completely released as a gas. And that's what happens in some uh, infections like gas gangrene. But we release a molecule that's not coming back. It's very difficult to retrieve that CO2 because it's immediately going to be used in another reaction. It's going to interact with water and become carbonic acid. Right? So this enzyme can't retrieve the loss, in, the loss of that CO2. It can't get it back. Okay, but that's the right answer. So to re recap what we're doing, we're going to decarboxylate pyruvate. We're making that carbon ion, but it's not necessarily going to exist like you see it. It's going to be attached to TPP. Then we're going to oxidize it and remove a couple of electrons. We're going to transfer that thing to the lipoamide arm, which had those, that sulfur you saw in the ring. Then we'll transfer from that sulfur onto another sulfur on CoA to make acetyl-CoA, all the while crossing the inner mitochondrial membrane. So let's look at the first step. So I've simplified the, the drawing of TPP here. Uh, you remember it had uh, basically a pyrimidine ring and attached to it is this thiazole ring. Thiazole ring is a, a five-membered ring with a, a nitrogen and a sulfur in it, the other three being carbon. So we have this thiazole ring attached to a pyrimidine ring. 
And I've abbreviated all the other parts, like the pyrophosphate and the, the pyrimidine rings, as just R and R prime up there. We're only looking at the business end of the molecule. Okay, so the important part here is the carbon between the nitrogen and the sulfur. And so if you look at the bottom of the figure, you notice that carbon has an acidic proton. And so that carbon can very easily lose its proton. Most of the time, if you have hydrogens on carbons, they generally don't dissociate, like a methyl group. Right? But here, because of the presence of the other hetero elements, the nitrogen and the sulfur, it makes that rearrangement at the bottom possible. Right? So because of that rearrangement, the movement of those electrons around, we can deprotonate that carbon to generate a nucleophile. Right? So that carbanion, or TPP, as it's being deprotonated, can act as a nucleophile and attack the pyruvate. So pyruvate is going to be attacked, as in the case of virtually every reaction we're going to talk about this semester, the nucleophilic attack is going to occur on a carbonyl. Okay? So we have the carbanion's lone pair, attacking the, the red carbonyl there. And when it does so, it goes up and forms an O minus, as you would expect, like we did with chymotrypsin and many other mechanisms. And when it tries to collapse back down, it doesn't let it. Okay? So instead of it collapsing back to a carbonyl, we dispose of the CO2 right, and attach a proton there in its place. Where do we get the proton? From a water molecule nearby. Okay? So we've taken the carbanion of TPP and made a new carbon-carbon bond between the isolated carbon, between the nitrogen and sulfur, to the carbonyl, carbon number two of pyruvate. We've lost carbon number one of pyruvate as CO2. So now I have a new carbon-carbon bond between TPP, right, and what's now a two-carbon alcohol. So it's a hydroxyethyl. So it's a two-carbon alcohol, hydroxyethyl group. And so we call it hydroxyethyl TPP, because that's what's attached. And so we've done a couple things so far. We've accomplished the irreversible step right at the beginning, the loss of CO2. So we better complete this now. So the very beginning of it is where we do the irreversible part. And we have a carbon-carbon bond we just created that should not be very stable. We want to lose this carbon off of this thing later. So this new carbon-carbon bond is not clearly as stable as some other carbon-carbon bonds, like the others in these rings. Okay? But now our two-carbon group left over, carbons 2 and 3 of pyruvate, are now attached to this TPP cofactor. Okay, so what happens next? Our TPP, with its hydroxyethyl group, again, that carbon on the end is sort of has an acidic proton. Right? Normally alcohols don't lose their proton on the O, and certainly don't lose their proton from the carbons, but because of the presence of this TPP nearby again, this carbon can easily be deprotonated. And so it deprotonates. There's a general base in the enzyme that does it. You don't have to know what it is. But we deprotonate. You notice the only difference between the previous slide and this one is this hydrogen has been removed, the very one we just put on. right? And nearby is our lipoamide cofactor. Okay, so I've abbreviated the rest of the, the arm of lipoamide, the other carbons, but the business end of it, carbon 6, 7, and 8, with the two sulfurs in a ring, right? this is a, a dithiolane ring, so that means it's just got two sulfurs in it, dithio, and it's on car not carbons, but they're in positions 1 and 2 had it been a five-membered cyclopentane. So the sulfurs are next to each other. That's all this means. So what happens is we open this ring, we have this carbon attack one of the sulfurs, right? And then the other, the lone pair between the two sulfurs, gets transplanted onto one of the sulfurs. So we open the ring, and that's a favorable thing to do. So effectively, we lose the carbon-carbon bond, and we make a new carbon-sulfur bond, right? And at the same time, this proton on the OH leaves, it collapses to a carbonyl, and that proton, or another proton, ends up on the other sulfur. So what have we done in this case? We've released our TPP, it's free to go, it can do the reaction again, and we've transferred the two carbons onto a second carrier. Okay, it came in as pyruvate, it lost the CO2, the remaining two carbons are carried by the TPP temporarily, and then they transfer the same two carbons to the lipoamide, who is now carrying an acetate group. 
right? So it has been oxidized, right? When we remove those two electrons, it has been oxidized. So it's now an acetate group, okay? So this is still done by the same enzyme, E1. It's doing all of this chemistry. But the important part here is this lipoamide is not just isolated. It's attached to the enzyme, right? So over here on the right, you see my business end at the bottom of the lipoamide, and it's got those eight carbons of the, the fatty acid that became lipoamide. That fatty acid is attached to the R group of a lysine. Okay, so the lysine, you remember, has this four carbons and then an amino group at the end. I've attached the valeric acid side chain here to the amino group of lysine, making this 11 atom arm on which the business sulfurs are attached. So the protein backbone is here, and I have an 11 atom chain before I get to where my two carbon group is attached. That's a rather long arm. Right? So what it can do is swing from one side of the membrane to the other. And so what it's doing is dragging these two carbons from one side of the membrane through the enzyme to the other side. And this is what allows it to cross the membrane. Okay? So on the other side of the membrane now, now we're on the matrix side, Right? Our lipoamide, with its two-carbon cargo, is facing the interior, the matrix of the mitochondria, and a coenzyme A shows up. Right? It's in the matrix, there's lots of them, and it shows up with its SH on the end. Right? The sulfur gets deprotonated, the sulfur then attacks the carbonyl, the same one we've been attacking the whole time, so the sulfur attacks and displaces the lipoamide from it. This is virtually a free reaction. We've transferred one thioester bond to another thioester bond. Okay? And so our lipoamide is now free to go, but it's got a problem. Our lipoamide ring has been completely reduced. It's open. So because we oxidized the two carbon group, right, we've also reduced the lipoamide ring. Right? So it's been opened up into a dihydrolipoamide, no longer a ring. In order for this enzyme to do this again with a se separate pyruvate, I need to fix this ring. And this is where the other parts of the enzyme come in. So the lipoamide has to be regenerated. So I need to take this ring and close it. Well, if I do that, that's removing these two protons, right, and a pair of electrons, and forming a sulfur, sulfur bond, a disulfide bond. I can do that if I remove the protons and electrons and give them to FAD to make the reduced form FADH2. Okay, it's a very simple redox reaction. Right, so now I've regenerated the lipoamide and the enzyme's good to go, I can do it again, except I have a problem. Now I've taken my FAD out of the equation. The FAD is gone. I need another one to continue. We can solve that problem. An NAD says I'll gladly accept your electrons and one of your protons to regenerate the FAD. So we're playing hot potato with a bunch of electrons. And this is not the end of the chain either. We're going to play a long game with, this, with, with these electrons. So FAD will donate its electrons to NAD to make NADH. Of course, it can't hold the extra proton, so it just floats in the solution, interacts with the water molecule, perhaps. And now the FAD is regenerated. Well, this argument just can keep going. Don't I need another NAD to continue? Yes, I do. And we're going to see what we do with all these excess NADHs, which we generated back in glycolysis as well, when we get to the citric acid cycle, sorry, when we get to the electron transport chain after that. And so we've compounded our problem with more NAD plus being reduced to NADH, and we'll see how we handle that when we get to the electron transport chain. But as of now, we've regenerated our enzyme. Right? It can do it again if it's supplied with yet another pyruvate. And so here's a diagram showing all those parts put together. The, the structure of this complex is huge, right? It's embedded in the membrane. If you remember back when we talked about proteins, the ones that are embedded in a membrane, so integral membrane proteins are very hard to purify, right? Because they're surrounded by all these lipids. So we can only purify parts of it at a time. The parts that are sticking out of the membrane are easier to purify. The parts that are inside, we have to tear apart or tease apart. And there's many, many subunits. Remember, 24 of one, 24 of another, and 12 of a third. So this is a very difficult assignment. So we've kind of had an idea how the subunits come together. Now, each one of these up here at top, it says E1, E2, and E3, represents several subunits put together, two to four subunits put together. And then they come together with eight catalytic trimers. Now, you don't have to remember all those numbers, but remember this complex is huge. 
So one pyruvate coming in is not what it does. Several pyruvates can enter and several acetyl-CoA's leave. So they work in tandem with each other. As soon as E1 finishes the reaction, it hands its product to E2 right away. It's a very efficient transfer. Right, so the, the important part is all this is connected and our lipoamide, which is, remember was on this very long arm, so if you look at it closely, you see the colors here. There's the, the four carbons of the lysines R group, the nitrogen, the carbonyl, the four other carbons of that chain, and then our, our dithiovalane ring at the end, right, which is where our, our cargo, carbon cargo would be carried. Too many C's in that sense. Right, and this is able to swing from one side of the membrane to the other with this length of an arm. All right, here's another diagram showing it. Uh, some people like this one, some people don't. I um, just want to show it to you multiple ways. One of them will click for you, I hope. So let's look at the top one real quick. All right, so just look at this one square right here where there's two pink circles, uh, a green and a yellow. Okay, so on the top of this figure represents the face of the membrane, the inner mitochondrial membrane, that faces outward, right? Faces the inner membrane space, which is continuous solution with the cytoplasm, right? So this is where we're going to pick up our pyruvate, right? Underneath the pink circles, in the same first square, underneath the pink circles represents the other side of the membrane, right? The face of the inner mitochondrial membrane that faces the matrix, right? So that's the inner volume. Okay. And each of these six panels shows a progression of the reaction. Again, at the top, above the yellow and green circles represents the outside, and below the pink circles represents the interior, or the matrix. So in the first step, let's look at the middle panel. Right, it's our, our resting membrane enzyme, and there's nothing attached, right? E1, E2, and E3 are just sitting here. Everybody's ready to go. TPP is bound, the lipoamide is bound, the ring is closed, and FAD is bound. The first thing to show up would be our substrate pyruvate. And so pyruvate binds. You know what happens in the first step. We the TPP deprotonates, attacks the pyruvate's number two carbon, the carbonyl, and we hit a loss of CO2. The number one carbon leaves. So there's shown here the CO2 leaving. All right. So this would show all the chemistry steps. I'm going to show you where things are moving. And now we have our hydroxyethyl attached to a TPP. Okay. And the next step. The hydroxyethyl, right, the, is, is sitting here, and the lipoamide arm, which we said was very long and flexible, reaches into the same active site, because it's on this side of the membrane, and interacts with our hydroxyethyl group. The sulfur gets attached to the carbon. We went over the chemistry of that last slide with the deprotonation here, and it opens this ring. Okay, so the carbon sulfur bond is made here, and this ring is opened. We break the carbon-carbon bond between TPP and the hydroxyethyl group. Right? Then the lipoamide, having picked up its cargo, swings it across to the other side of the membrane into the site down here for E2. Okay, so the pink is E2. On this side, since it's closer to the matrix solution now, a CoA molecule can show up and it displaces what's now the acetate group from the lipoamide sulfur. And that's just transfer from one sulfur to another. These two carbons of the acetate group leave with CoA to form the acetyl-CoA. And the lipoamide arm needs some repair now, right? We need to fix it. So it swings over into the E3 site, the enzyme E3, for its repair. The FAD oxidizes this into a disulfide bond again, becoming reduced itself to FADH2. And then finally, the FADH2 gets oxidized back to FAD, and at the same time, NAD plus gets reduced to NADH. This is happening again on the cytoplasmic side. Okay, and then we're ready to do this reaction all over again. And I tried to color code all the text at the bottom with the enzymes up here that are working together to accomplish this. You see, the main reason this works is because of this long lipoamide arm that can swing into multiple active sites. And so what are the products of this reaction? Well, we started with pyruvate and NAD+, and our end products are going to be an acetyl-CoA and NADH, but they're not in the places where we started. The NAD+, was in the cytoplasm, the NADH, also in the cytoplasm. The pyruvate was in the cytoplasm, 
and the CO2 is wherever it wants to go. It can diffuse through the membrane easily. And the acetyl-CoA ends up in the matrix. So we accomplished moving it across the membrane at the same time. Now here's another diagram showing our position in the grand scheme of things here. How is this regulated? Because we knew py glucose to pyruvate and pyruvate to glucose in glycolysis or gluconeogenesis, which we covered in the last le lecture, these are highly regulated processes. We don't need these both going on at the same time, unregulated. And also, once we pass the step, which is what we're talking about now in green, we're going to do the citric acid cycle down here. So that's turning acetyl-CoA into the CO2. Or if we don't need ATP right now, we can turn a lot of this acetyl-CoA into the synthesis of lipids, which we'll cover in a later lecture. Right? So the lipids can also be broken down into more acetyl-CoA. The important thing here is our middle step connecting the glycolysis and gluconeogenesis pathways and our citric acid cycle and lipid synthesis and degradation pathways down here. They're separated by our gap here, our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And it is an irreversible step. And this is the reason why we can turn sugars, glucose, into fats, lipids, but we cannot turn fats back into sugars. Right? That's because the step is irreversible. As you, you can eat all the glucose you want, and you can turn it into all the fats you want in the body and store it, but we can never turn those fats back into sugars with a net gain of sugar. And it's because of this pyruvate dehydrogenase step that is completely irreversible, and you told me why it was the loss of CO2. Okay. How do we regulate it? Well, it's regulated almost identically to glycolysis because this is a step in the glycolytic chain. So we're degrading our sugar into pyruvate. We're further oxidizing it to an acetate group, and then we're going to further oxidize it all the way to CO2s. So it's regulated much in the same way as glycolysis was. When you have lots of ATP around, do you want to activate the process that makes more ATP, or would you want to downregulate the process that makes more ATP? So you're very abundant in ATP. Would you want to activate the process or downregulate the process that makes more ATP? Downregulate. Downregulate, which is exactly what we did in glycolysis. If you had lots of pyruvate and we had lots of ATP around, we shut down glycolysis. Not completely, but we slowed it down at step three, right? And at step 10. Here, we have one step. It's the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. It's one big enzyme with three enzymatic parts, if you don't think about it that way. So what would turn this pathway off? Well, lots of ATP would turn it off, so this makes sense. If we have lots of ATP, the panel at the bottom right with, says A, high energy charge. If we have lots of ATP, which we're going to generate later from all these electrons, we'll turn down pyruvate dehydrogenase. The product of this pathway, acetyl-CoA, will also turn down pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. NADH, a product of this pathway, also turns it down. So everything that this enzyme leads to a production of shuts it down, which makes perfect sense. What would activate pyruvate dehydrogenase? Well, if I'm lacking ATP, it would activate it. How do I detect a lack of ATP? You can't detect the absence of something. You must detect something else that indicates its absence. So in this case, an ADP molecule indicates that there's not a lot of ATP around if I'm abundant, if there's lots of ADP around. So ADP binding instead of ATP activates it. This was just like we saw in glycolysis. Also, its substrate molecule, if there's lots of pyruvate around, right, and a lack of ATP, Right? Pyruvate will bind and say, hey, keep up. Just like we told step 10 to keep up with step 3 in glycolysis, we're going to tell pyruvate dehydrogenase, keep up with glycolysis, right? if there's a lack of ATP. So it's, it makes perfect sense. And then one last thing, if ATP is abundant, not only does it bind here and shut it down, but it also powers a kinase. Okay? So this enzyme, this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, shown here as the the yellow square and circle, right? It has a site on it where it can be phosphorylated, right? I'm gonna let you guess what amino acid it might be. 
right? So it has an amino acid where it can be phosphorylated, and that's shown going from the circle to the square with a phosphate attached. And the phosphate was attached by, as usual, a kinase. It transferred the phosphate on. And of course, this phosphate is continually removed by a phosphatase, which cuts it off, right? If these two processes, the kinase putting it on and the phosphatase cutting it off, happen simultaneously all the time, it's only going to remain in the phosphorylated state if ATP is readily available. If ATP is missing or not abundant, the phosphatase is going to win the fight and it's going to be turned into the active form, right? which makes perfect sense logistically. If ATP is abundant, I don't need this active right now. So it gets phosphorylated and becomes inactive. If ATP is not abundant, then the phosphatase is going to win this fight. It's going to cut it off more often than it gets put back on, and I'll have an active pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which will allow me to make more ATP down the line. So this makes sense Look, from a logical standpoint. But from our, our intuition standpoint, most of the time when you phosphorylate an enzyme, it makes it active. And when you dephosphorylate an enzyme, it makes it inactive. Well, this one's unusually the opposite. So this is an unusual difference, and I want to point out that when things are not usual. So this is an unusual inactivation due to being phosphorylated. Normally, when you phosphorylate an enzyme, in the vast majority of cases, you activate that enzyme. Here's an example where it's the opposite. Okay? But the opposite makes logical sense. The presence of lots of ATP activates the kinase, or allows the kinase to function, and turns off the enzyme because I don't need ATP right now. In the absence of ATP, or absence of abundance of ATP, the phosphatase is going to win the fight. And so the phosphate is removed more often than added, and we have an active pyruvate dehydrogenase, which can then allow me to make more ATP. So it makes sense, but it's an unusual regulation. Okay, okay let's look at some problems that can occur. We said thiamine, which is your vitamin B1, allows you to make the TPP. And if you don't have a lot of B1 in your diet, you're going to be lacking in TPP, which means your ability to do pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is going to be diminished. So your cells are not going to be very efficient at making ATP as if they were when you had B1 in abundance. Right? So one way to mimic the appearance of a B1 deficiency is to add certain chemicals, right? So anybody recognize these figures on the top right? Particularly the guy in the hat. Yeah, yeah that's the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland. Right, this is an Alice in Wonderland drawing. That's the Mad Hatter. And why was, well, why was he mad? Uh, because they used to form the brims of hats with mercury, so he went into contact with that. Right, so he was a hatter, which means he made hats. And one of the, the steps in making a hat after you stitched it together and however they, they sewed it is to form it to the head of the individual for which you're making it. And of course, that customer is not going to be around all the time. So the hatter generally use their own head to make the shape of the hat. And one of the, the chemicals they used in tanning it, like you mentioned, was mercury. Right? So it shaped the leather in the hat or the, the cloth or whatever they used in the hat. I don't know why they couldn't invent a, a wooden dummy to put these hats on, but you know, they use their own head. Uh, so he kept putting this on his head, and of course, eventually, all that exposure to mercury, the mercury is going to get in his system, and it causes lots of brain damage, and that's why he was mad. Right? They don't mean angry, they mean he, he lost his mind. Right? So, so hatters generally had the reputation of being you know, kind of loopy. They, they lose their mind after exposure to mercury all this time. So what's, what's the exposure to mercury actually going to do right, on the short term? So exposure to heavy metals like mercury and arsenic generally aren't very bad if they're in their metallic forms. Metallic mercury is not very dangerous compared to the mercury or arsenic in its salt forms, like the arsenite you've seen below. Right, so this is the oxidized form of the metal. Right? Mercury or arsenic in there, it's in a salt form now. Right? So gold is the same way. Gold in its metallic form is virtually harmless. Right? We wear jewelry made of gold. Right? We use gold in procedures where we have to have uh, contrasts. But if you have it in its salt form, it's quite dangerous. 
just as mercury and arsenic are. Okay, so at the bottom you see this arsenite salt interacting with an opened lipoamide ring. So this lipoamide was in the process of doing the chemistry and we have an open ring. The next step would be to reform the disulfide bond. However, the arsenic gets in the way. It says, I would like to make that bond for you. It's losing a pair of hydroxides along with the protons, it's a very good leaving groups in water. It forms this new ring where the arsenic is now attached to the two sulfurs. And much like other heavy metals like mercury and, and gold and arsenic and plutonium and a lot of other heavy metals bind to sulfur very well. Right? So arsenic and mercury bind very well to sulfur. And so you make this sulfur arsenic bond, right? It's called a chelate of the arsenite. Right? So it, it's the metal has been chelated by the sulfurs. Well, this is very bad because now I can't close that ring, and that means this enzyme is not going to work again. This is this is not coming off. It's effectively an irreversible inhibitor unless I can remove it. And normally you can't remove it and that cell will eventually die. Right? So if you have someone who's exhibiting symptoms of vitamin B1 deficiency or uh, mercury or arsenic poisoning, it's called beriberi is the name of the disorder, right? If they're exhibiting these symptoms when they come in the hospital, it's one of two causes generally. Either they have been poisoned by heavy metals or they have a vitamin B1 deficiency. One of those is easily fixed. So if someone comes in exhibiting similarities to beriberi symptoms, what's the first thing you should do? I can determine which one it is rather easily. Blood test? Simpler. We, we'll get to a, a, Yeah, you get a B1 shot right away, right? Excess B1 is harmless. Right? You won't store it, you'll get rid of it in the urine, and it won't hurt you at all. But if you're B1 deficient, we will notice an improvement. So really quickly, if I can give you a, a B1 shot, a supplement, and your symptoms improve, I'm very happy because it's unlikely now it's metal toxicity. It's just a B1 deficiency. And then we talk about changing your diet, and maybe getting on a vitamin, a very simple problem solved. If the B1 shot does not improve it, and a second B1 shot still doesn't improve it, uh, we might be worried about metal toxicity. So we'll do your blood test you suggested for mercury, arsenic, gold, other metals that are in the bloodstream. Okay, so if that's the case, we can still reverse some of the effects. I need to give this, get this arsenic off of the lipoamide ring, right? And it's, I think we've played this game before, and how do you get a toy away from a two-year-old? You give them a better toy. Right? It's the only way to get the toy away. So, so instead of giving this, this trying to destroy this whole complex, I'm going to replace the arsenic with a different molecule, or replace the what the arsenic is bound to with a different molecule. So the arsenic or mercury right now is bound to this lipoamide pair of sulfurs. If I give it another pair of sulfurs, which it might like even better, then it will bind to those instead. So we'll add the molecule called 2,3-dimercaptopropanol, or dithiopropanol. Um, it's one of the worst smelling things you can ever give someone. Thiols you know, we don't smell very good. Uh, so we give it this molecule, and it's basically a glycerol molecule. If you notice, it looks just like glycerol, where I've replaced a pair of the oxygens with sulfurs. Okay, so it's not harmful metabolically, because it's just, it works just like glycerol, except these two are now sulfur. So you can't use it like you would glycerol, but it very tightly binds to these arsenic and mercury salts. So it'll bind to the arsenic, remove it. The enzyme is now back to normal. I can close the ring and continue, and that cell survives. I will get rid of this molecule, this arsenic salt attached to this uh, mercaptopropanol through the urine. Now, it may kill a few kidney cells on the way out, but that's better than dying, right? So, and it'll also discolor it quite a bit, right? So if you're worried about someone with these symptoms of beriberi, you give them a B1 shot, if it doesn't improve, we'll do the blood test to check for metals. If there's definitely a metal toxicity of mercury or arsenic or something like that, we'll add this 2,3-dimercaptopropanol and it will not be pleasant, but you'll live. Okay, so at this point, we've complete, completed turning our pyruvate into an acetyl-CoA. And now it's going to enter the citric acid cycle. Okay, so let's briefly go over the citric acid cycle on the top right here. It's a very generic diagram of what's going to happen. 
We're going to do eight reactions along the way. We'll talk about each one like we did glycolysis. And then I'll give you an analogy at the end to help you track these carbons, right? Uh, it's a very funny analogy. I didn't come up with it initially. I'll give him credit when we get there. But it's a great way to remember where things are going. Okay, so let's start at the top. And the two, it says C2 up here. That's going to be my acetate group of the acetyl-CoA. The CoA doesn't enter the cycle. It donates the two carbons to the cycle. So just like all the other things, it's been carrying it for me. Okay? So here's my two carbons entering the cycle. They will combine with a molecule of oxaloacetate. We've seen this molecule before. Right? We know how we made it. We transported a pyruvate into the mitochondria as a whole pyruvate and carboxylated it. This was the first step of gluconeogenesis. Keep in mind, these pathways are intertwined. They're not separate. We gotta remember that. So that's how we have an oxaloacetate present. We took a pyruvate, we imported it into the mitochondria as a pyruvate, as a whole, and then carboxylated it with pyruvate carboxylase. That was first step of gluconeogenesis. That's how we have oxaloacetate there. If I combined a four carbon oxaloacetate with a two carbon acetate from acetyl-CoA, I'm going to end up with a six carbon molecule. Four plus two, six. That six carbon molecule is the molecule for which this cycle is named. It's called citrate. Okay, so it's a six carbon molecule. It's got three carboxyl groups on it, three COO minuses, right? And that's why it's called the TCA cycle sometimes, tricarboxylic acid cycle. The tricarboxyl group they're talking about, the tricarboxyl containing molecule is citrate. So when you say TCA, you're really talking about citrate. So they're one and the same thing. Sometimes it's referred to as the Krebs cycle. We tend to not use that anymore because it's named after people. It doesn't really tell you what it's about. They did discover it and describe it. They also described a few other cycles, a few other pathways, but it doesn't tell you exactly what's going on. Whereas naming it for one of the molecules or the starting assembly molecule in the pathway does give you a sense of what's going on. So I have citrate here. Not shown in this figure is we're going to convert citrate into an isomer of citrate called isocitrate. Right? That step's not shown in the picture up here. And the important next two steps are shown. We're going to take our six carbon isocitrate, decarboxylate it, and at the same time oxidize it. You notice NADH leaving here. It should say NAD plus coming in and NADH leaving, but you get the idea. We'll look at each step in a minute. And I end up with five carbons remaining because I lost one. Okay. In the next step, we're going to pull the similar mechanism. We're going to lose a CO2 again, oxidize it one more time, and end up with a four carbon molecule. From here on, we're not going to lose any more carbons, but we are going to do some oxidation. We're going to do two more oxidation steps to get this four carbon molecule into the form of oxaloacetate when we're done. Along the way, we're going to gain some energy because this last step here actually made a thioester bond on CoA, which we're going to take advantage of to generate one ATP equivalent in the form of GTP here to make our four carbon molecule into a free four carbon molecule. It was attached to CoA. It won't be afterwards. And then we just oxidize it a couple of times and we're back to oxaloacetate. Two more carbons can enter, and we play the same game over and over and over. The, the product of the citric acid cycle is threefold. We're, we're getting some CO2s leaving, but we don't really care about them. They're not really a, a product. They're more of a byproduct. They're waste. right? The important things we're going to get out of here is electrons in the form of NADH and FADH2. And we're going to get one GTP or ATP equivalent generated from the cycle directly. Where does this fit into our grand scheme of things here? Well, let's, let's look at the picture at the bottom. This little gray bar running through it is our inner mitochondrial membrane, whereas outside of it will be cytoplasm, or continuous with the cytoplasm, and inside of it, this U-shaped area, will be the matrix of the mitochondria. So what we've seen so far is we can take glucose, turn it into pyruvate, and import that pyruvate in one of two ways. One directly turning it into oxaloacetate after we carboxylate it. The other doing the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex we just talked about to make an acetyl-CoA. That enters our citric acid cycle here, uh, very generically drawn here. We have two CO2s leaving, we get one GTP made, and four pairs of electrons being generated. Those pairs of electrons, which we'll talk about in the next lecture, 
will travel down the electron transport chain, ultimately creating a proton gradient, which we use to make or synthesize ATP. Okay. So, what did you say so, the product for, for the Go ahead. What did you say the products were for the citric acid cycle? So we have several products. One we're going to call a, a waste byproduct. That's going to be our CO2 because we're not going to do anything else with it. The other is electrons, which are being carried by NADHs and FADH2s. Right? We're going to get eight electrons out of this, four pairs. You see each one's carrying a pair of electrons. That's where we get eight. And we also get one GTP, which is an ATP equivalent. We're not going to consider oxaloacetate a product of the cycle because we had to use one to get it started and we regenerate it when we're done. So it's not a net gain of oxaloacetate. Okay, so here are the eight steps shown in the same way we analyzed our glycolysis pathway. So I want you to do this again the same way. And in fact, the very same video I recommended for you for the glycolysis pathway has been done for, if you can find it, it's been done for citric acid cycle. Same lady does the, the brilliant analysis and the molecules are there. They break the bonds by stretching them. They form the new bonds. But I think they set this one to music the last time I saw it. So you may want to mute it after you hear it a couple times. But we'll, we'll play the same game we did with glycolysis. There are eight steps here. We'll look at them as far as their delta Gs are concerned. You're going to discuss whether you think they're reversible or not and then what their substrates and products are. So let's start at the first step. I know it's a cycle, but we have to start somewhere. So we'll start where we introduce the two new carbons. So they're shown here in green. So let's walk around this one time and discuss what's happening. So our two new carbons are showing up attached to CoA, and we have an oxaloacetate already present and a water molecule. Okay, so what happens is we transfer these two carbons, the two new carbons shown here in green, from a CoA molecule, this is a thioester bond, that's rather easy to break, right, onto oxaloacetate. Okay, so it's easy to figure out what's going to happen. The carbon here, the methyl group, is going to deprotonate, right, so we have some enzyme, it's some general base, it's going to deprotonate the methyl group, leaving behind the CH2 with a negative charge, it's a very good nucleophile. It's going to attack, as usual, a carbonyl. This looks like a great carbonyl to attack. So this carbon attacks this carbon number two of oxaloacetate. Of course, this can't have five bonds, so this carbonyl becomes an OH in the process. And that's what the water is involved in, generating the, the H for that. And eventually we need to cut off this, this CoA molecule, so the remainder of the water molecule, the OH minus that's left behind, breaks the bond here, and we have a release of CoA. Okay, so CoA leaves. We end up with a two-carbon group attached here at number two. We've taken the molecule and flipped it over on you here. So if I count one, two, three, four, this would be one, two, three, four from bottom to top here. So the molecule's flipped over on you here, right? And then the two carbons of citrate, or two carbons of uh, the acetate has become these two carbons of citrate. So this would be carbon number one and two, represented as one and two here. And so we made this six carbon molecule. It's not six in a row, it's five in a row with a branch point because we entered at number two. So it's a tricarboxylic acid. It's got three carboxyl groups. Okay? And citrate is considered to be a prochiral molecule. Right? It might look like this carbon is not chiral. And if we were to release citrate, into the solution, it would not be chiral because these two groups are identical to each other, right? But citrate is considered prochiral because we really don't release it that well and the next enzyme grabs it immediately so I know which carbons are still which. These two are already there and these two are the new additions. So although it doesn't look chiral, we're going to call it prochiral because it retains its chirality. I know which two are the new carbons because I hand it to the next enzyme immediately. Okay. So this reaction of citrate synthase makes citrate. I release a, a CoA, right, and all six carbons are here. I said we're going to take this molecule and make an isomer of citrate. Well, that's rather easy to do. I'm just going to take this OH off right here, right, and replace it on this carbon. So the OH is moving from carbon number three up to carbon number two. Right? 
So it's not here anymore, it's up on carbon number two. Why did I do that? Because in the next step, I'm going to oxidize this molecule, right? I can oxidize this OH group, which is a secondary alcohol, to a carbonyl, right, to a ketone. I could not oxidize it here because it's a tertiary alcohol. I can't oxidize tertiary alcohol. So there's no proton to remove. So that's why we had to move it up to number two in order to do the next step, the oxidation step. So in the next step, we do just that. We oxidize this to a carbonyl, which makes this CO2, right, or this carboxyl group, beta keto to it, right? We'll see that when we look at the, the step in detail. Well, it makes this not stable, so this CO2 leaves. There it goes. No CO2 here anymore. And I've made a five carbon molecule now. I've lost the very branched CO2, and now it's a five carbon alpha ketoglutarate. Why is it called alpha ketoglutarate? Glute generally indicates five carbons, and glutarate indicates that there's two carboxyl groups, right? Much like your amino acids, right? Glutamate, that indicates there's an amino group there. This one has no amino group, so it's glutarate. And it's alpha keto. This end is very stable. When we made this into a double bond here, right, to the carbonyl, this carboxyl group was alpha keto, and this one was beta. That's why we lost this one. This one down here was gamma, and that's too far away to care. Okay, so we had an alpha, beta, and a gamma arrangement. We're going to lose the beta arrangement. Okay, so once again, we have alpha ketoglutarate. We're going to play the same game one more time. We're going to lose this CO2 at the top. Right? This should look very familiar. I'm going to lose the CO2 and attach the molecule to CoA. This looks very similar to what we just did with our pyruvate. Right? Pyruvate dehydrogenase did the exact same chemistry. It lost the CO2, it oxidized this, and attached it to CoA. The only difference was we have two more carbons attached. So if you ignore the two green carbons, this is pyruvate. So it looks exactly like what we were doing before, but we have two extra carbons. It is a different enzyme, right? So it recognizes the larger substrate, but the chemistry is identical to what we did for pyruvate. And it's in fact got all three parts, E1, E2, E3, and all the other little parts. And so we lose CO2 one more time, just like with PDH. We oxidize it, and we have this molecule attached to CoA now. This four-carbon molecule is called succinate, but it's succinyl-CoA. It's attached to CoA. Here's that new thioester we just made. We're going to take advantage of that. Cutting this off of the CoA, I can get a molecule of GTP generated, and I release this four-carbon molecule as succinate. Okay, so there's my GTP made, and I've made succinate. The only thing left to do is turn succinate back into oxaloacetate, so I can do this again. And the only difference between succinate and oxaloacetate is this carbonyl. So to go from a CH2, which is basically in the methane stage, to a carbonyl, which is in the carbonyl or ketone stage, I need to do two oxidations. So the first thing to do is get these hydrogens out of my way. I need to remove a couple of protons here and electrons, and I make a double bond between it. So I go from this alkane to an alkene, that's an oxidation. Then I hydrate that alkene to make an alcohol, secondary alcohol, and then I oxidize the alcohol group to a carbonyl. All right, I'm back where I started. All right, so these last few steps are just turning succinate into oxaloacetate. Don't think of them as huge, difficult steps. They just happen in sequence. I'm gonna oxidize, hydrate, and oxidize again. Okay, so which of these steps of this eight-step pathway do you think are going to be irreversible? Just from principles you've learned, which ones do you think are going to be irreversible? Step four. Step, and step um, three. Okay, so step four, for the very same reason that the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex was irreversible, absolutely right, a loss of CO2, but equivalently valid, we have a loss of CO2 here. So step three is also going to be irreversible. Okay, so those two are absolutely irreversible because of the loss of CO2. Okay? If you look up here at their uh, delta Gs, they're not that very large and negative. Right? But because of the loss of CO2, they're irreversible. Okay? The other one we're going to consider metabolically irreversible is the first step. It can go backwards. It's just not going to happen in the cell. So we won't call it truly irreversible but it's metabolically irreversible in a cell. In fact, we can make it go backwards easily in a test tube and solution. 
Okay, so that's this step here of citrate synthase, right? Because we're always supplying new acetyl-CoAs and always taking away citrates in the next step. So this one generally doesn't go backwards in the cell. Okay, but the other steps, right, the other five are completely reversible, right? And we'll consider these two, steps three and step four, absolutely irreversible. In fact, if you're, if you're very curious about the malate dehydrogenase here, you've actually seen it before. We just used it in the other direction, right? When we were doing our gluconeogenesis, I said we took pyruvate, made oxaloacetate by carboxylating it, and then we couldn't get it out of the mitochondria. We had to turn it into malate first. It was just using this step, step eight of our citric acid cycle, run in reverse. Remember, everything's intertwined here. Don't think of these as isolated events. So we turned it into malate and got this out in our malate shuttle. Remember that. It was just using this enzyme that's fully reversible. Okay. So let's go through these eight steps one at a time and answer some questions about them and what happens. So starting at the beginning, we're going to call this one metabolically irreversible, but it can go backwards in a test tube. Uh, just not going to happen in a cell. We take our oxaloacetate, four carbon molecule, is oxaloacetate stable? We've answered this question before. No. Why not? As a beta keto. It's a beta keto arrangement, right? Exactly. Which of these CO2s, the top or the bottom, is the very unstable one? The one that's likely to leave? The bottom. The bottom, right? Which is the one we put on to make it from pyruvate. If you cover up this, this is pyruvate, okay? So we don't want this to happen. We want to consume this oxaloacetate in the step. We don't want to lose it and make pyruvate. So we attack it with an acetyl-CoA. So here's our two carbons of our acetyl-CoA. The methyl group is going to get deprotonated by the enzyme, leaving behind a CH2 minus. That's going to attack this carbonyl right here. right? And of course, it will go up and form an O minus. And that O minus will get protonated by a water molecule, forming OH. right? And then I've, I've tried not to flip it over this time like they did in the other one. So these are the two new carbons. They're still here, still attached to CoA. This is an intermediate. This carbon attacked carbon number two of oxaloacetate. It's right here. Carbon number one is the one off to the right. And carbons numbers three and four are still three and four. This might be easier to see where things are going. So this carbon attacks here. And this forms OH. There it is. Okay. This is citriol CoA, right? Is this a stable arrangement? Is citriol CoA stable? So you're searching for beta ketos, I know, and you should not find any, which is great. We got rid of the beta keto arrangement. However, what do we still have? What unstable bond is still present? If you're looking at this, this is not beta keto. This is gamma keto. So that's okay. What is this here? At the top, where the carbon is attached to the sulfur. Thioester. It's still a thioester, which is labile to water, right? So we use the water molecule to protonate this here and to break this thioester bond. So we break it off, CoA leaves, and I left with just citrate. Okay. So this is not going to go backwards because of several things. We break a thioester bond. We eliminated a beta keto group. All those are very favorable things. So this is unlikely to go backwards. Okay. So this is the important step in the pathway. We can regulate this step. If I don't want to consume my acetyl-CoA, I don't do this step because it's essentially irreversible in the cell. Okay. If I leave this alone and let acetyl-CoA accumulate, it could have a problem. It could hydrolyze this, just water breaking the bond here without this first being attached. And that's bad because then we'll just release acetates. Right? So that's not good. So we want to regulate this. And the mechanism for this is very specific. Right? So these are my two substrates. One of them binds before the other in the enzyme. And the reason I want oxaloacetate to bind first is twofold. So oxaloacetate binding first, much like ATP binding first in our hexokinase, 
it stabilizes the ATP molecule. Here it stabilizes the oxaloacetate because this is beta keto. We don't want it losing its CO2. So the enzyme binds the oxaloacetate and upon doing so, changes its orientation, changes its conformation, just like hexokinase did, to make a pocket for acetyl-CoA. As in the case of hexokinase, it made a pocket for the glucose. Now acetyl-CoA binds, right? So when this acetyl-CoA binds, we have an immediate attack here to make citro-CoA. Now it's allowed to hydrolyze the bond and release the CoA and citrate. But in the absence of oxaloacetate, it won't bind acetyl-CoA and hydrolyze it. That's the idea here. It won't just hydrolyze our acetyl-CoA without first having oxaloacetate present. Okay. So what class of enzyme do you think citrate synthase is of our six classes? A lyase. Okay, why would you think lyase? I'm not saying you're right or wrong. I just want your rationale. Um, we're adding two molecules together. So putting two molecules together might lead you toward ligase. Is that what you said? Or did you say lyase? So normally, if you, if you try to put two molecules together, you're thinking ligase, right? Right. But it's not a ligase. So think about what's really happening here. Look at the, the progress of the two new carbons, the ones in, of the acetate group. They're first attached to a CoA molecule. And when we're done, they're attached to an oxaloacetate molecule. So effectively, the Coenzyme A has given its two carbons to oxaloacetate to make citrate. Now what do you think it is? I took something away from one molecule and gave it to another. Transferase. It's a transferase. It's not transferring a phosphate. I know you're used to seeing the kinases we talked about. This one's transferring an acetate group. Okay, so it's taking it away from acetyl-CoA, just leaving CoA behind, and giving it to oxaloacetate, making citrate. Okay? The mechanism doesn't work that way. It first attacks the oxaloacetate, and then the CoA leaves, because we have that intermediate, that citrate-CoA. But it's overall, effectively, a transferase. Right? We're taking two carbons from CoA, giving them to oxaloacetate to make citrate. Okay? So this is our one and only transferase in the citric acid cycle. It's the only one. Okay, so on to step two, we take our citrate molecule and play a little swap. We just want to move the OH from where it is on carbon three up to carbon two. Okay, and this is obviously an isomerase. Right, so we're moving the OH, it's just in a different spot when we're done, it has all the same parts, it's just called isocitrate. However, how the mechanism works, it works like a pair of lyases. The enzyme is not a lyase. It is an isomerase. That's an easy one. It's totally reversible. But it works as a pair of lyases. If it only did one of these two steps, it would be a lyase. However, the same enzyme accomplishes both steps. So overall, it is not a lyase because it undoes what it, what it does in the first step. It's an isomerase. Okay? So what it does is take citrate and first dehydrates it. And I highlighted the, the water molecule that's leaving, the OH, and one of the two H's on the carbon above, right, leaves and makes cis aconitate. This is not the end of the reaction. If it were the end of the reaction, this would be a lyase. We'll see that later, right? But it's not. This enzyme is not finished. It allows the water molecule to come back, but it only allows it to enter from the other side. Right? So the enzymes are very specific about how they let things move. So if a water molecule enters from the other side, it puts the OH on carbon number two. Right? So this is like Markovnikov's rules. The enzymes don't pay attention to that. They put it where they want. Right? And if it were to put it on carbon three, we'd be back at citrate. If it puts it on carbon two, we're at isocitrate. It can do either one. It's fully reversible. But each part of this mechanism is like a lyase. 
If I remove the water, I've made a new double bond. I did not do a redox. So that's a lyase. And then I add the water back, again, destroying the double bond without doing redox, another lyase. So mechanistically, it functions as a pair of lyases. But overall, when it's done, it's just an isomerase. And what was the point of all that? I moved the OH into a position from which I can oxidize it. It was on a tertiary carbon. I could not oxidize it before. Now I can. So having isocitrate there, right, shown at the bottom left of the reaction three, for isocitrate dehydrogenase, you see dehydrogenase, this is a redox reaction. Okay. So uh, by the way, the, uh, the isomerase up there, that's the only one in the citric acid cycle. So we had one transferase, we had one isomerase, and those are the only ones. Now we're on our first of four redox reactions. Okay, so we're going to have four oxidoreductases. This is the first one. So what we're going to do is oxidize that secondary alcohol in red to a carbonyl. Right, so in order to do that, we're going to use NAD+. NAD+, is going to take both electrons and one of the protons and get reduced to NADH, releasing the other proton. And we have our secondary alcohol has become a ketone. Okay? That oxalosuccinate intermediate in the center is an unstable beta-keto group. You should be able to recognize that at this point. And the one it's actually it's alpha, beta, and gamma keto. So compared to this carbonyl, this double bonded oxygen is alpha, alpha keto, that's great. Compared to it, this one is beta keto, that's not so good. And this one down here at the bottom is gamma keto, which is irrelevant. It's neither stable nor unstable. Okay. Too far away. So of those three, the beta keto arrangement is the most likely to, to cause a problem. So this is the CO2 that leaves. Right? There were three potential carboxyl groups that could leave, and it's this one every time. So when it leaves, I'm left behind with just a CH2. Right? And I have alpha keto glutarate. It's called alpha keto because it's still alpha keto present here. Right? Glutarate indicating there are four, sorry, five carbons and a dicarboxylic acid. Okay? This step is completely irreversible, the loss of CO2, and highly regulated. This is the most regulated step in the cycle. Why would that make sense? Well, when I, when I have a pathway, I tend to regulate it at the first irreversible step. I'm not counting step one here, much like we did with, with glycolysis, kept my glucose in the cell. I'm letting step one go so I don't destroy my acetyl-CoA's and I don't destroy my oxaloacetate. I get it in a much more favorable, stable form of citrate. This is mirroring glycolysis very well. So step three is followed a isomerase, much like step two was in glycolysis. And here's where I'm going to regulate it, at the step three that's irreversible. So far, it mirrors glycolysis perfectly. Okay? So highly regulated here. Once we have ox sorry, alpha ketoglutarate, we need to do the similar reaction that we did for pyruvate. And if you look at these molecules, alpha ketoglutarate, only look at the top three carbons, ignore the bottom two, it looks just like pyruvate. And when we're done, we're gonna get succinyl-CoA instead of acetyl-CoA. It's got two extra carbons. You notice the enzymes uses enzyme one, two, and three, E1, E2, E3. It uses a TPP, a lipomide, FAD, NAD. Everything's identical to pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. The only difference is here it uses a wider or longer substrate, alpha ketoglutarate, with five carbons instead of three pyruvate. It makes a longer product, succinyl CoA instead of acetyl CoA, and it does not cross the membrane. This thing is soluble, right? It sits inside the thing, in the mitochondria. So it's a smaller complex because it doesn't need to cross the membrane, but it still has all the same parts. Right? It has the lipoamide arm, it has the TPP, it does all the exact same chemistry. But it makes a product that's two carbons longer, but this one can't leave, it's in the matrix. So this is a soluble complex, whereas the other one was buried in a membrane. Okay? So again, this step is irreversible for the same reasons. We have a loss of CO2, right? and we have oxidation of the, the remaining carbon, which if this were to CO2 were to leave, it'd be an aldehyde, so we oxidize it once to a carboxyl group and attach it to our CoA molecule, much like we did before, and I have succinyl-CoA. Okay. At this point, I'm done oxidizing things. Right? All the oxidizing the, the two carbon units is done. 
I only need to get my molecule, my remaining four carbons, back to oxaloacetate. And that requires oxidizing one of those carbons as well, twice. But I'm done oxidizing the two carbon units. Okay. Right. So the first thing you need to do is cut the four carbon succinyl group off of the CoA. This is rather easy to do. You just provide a, a water molecule and cut it off. But that would be wasteful. Right. So there's a thioester thio bond there. There's some energy in that. I don't want to be wasteful. In fact, there's just enough energy in it to make a GTP, or in bacteria, it'd be an ATP. So the way this works is I have this succinyl CoA. Let's look at the mechanism. I have a thioester bond. It's not stable. This little yellow swath here represents the enzyme, right? So there's a histidine amino acid at the bottom in the enzyme, and two substrates have bound, the succinyl CoA in black and a phosphate in pink, okay? So the enzyme positions these two substrates to attack one another, the phosphate, which does not come from ATP at all, just a phosphate floating around, there's lots of them there, attacks, guess what, a carbonyl. Imagine that, right? And when it attacks the carbonyl, it forms the O- temporarily, collapses back to a carbonyl, and we lose the high energy bond of the CoA. Now I have a phosphate attached to a carboxyl group. That's called succinyl phosphate instead of succinyl CoA. I just have a different suffix. But the phosphate attached to the succinyl group is beta keto again. Right? So I've generated a beta keto group. This is not good. So the histidine says, I'll gladly take that phosphate off your hands. So the histidine's N1 nitrogen attacks the phosphate, removing it from the very unstable beta keto arrangement. And succinate is free to go. But now I have a phosphate attached directly to a histidine. This phosphorus nitrogen bond is not stable. Right, so what happens? GDP binds and says, I'll take that phosphate, put it on the end of my phosphate chain, and I'll leave with it. Because this phosphorus nitrogen arrangement on the histidine ring, this imidazole ring, has more energy in it than a GTP does. Just enough. Or right, same thing for ATP. So I can transfer the phosphate onto a GDP to make a GTP directly. This is substrate level phosphorylation for the third time. We saw it in step seven and 10 of glycolysis. We're seeing it here in step five of citric acid cycle. Okay, so be able to recognize similarities in processes. Right? We're not doing anything novel here. We've seen this before, we're just doing it again. Okay? A key thing to remember here is the, the substrate, so the product here is a succinate molecule, right? And now it's free to go. We let it go. It's not attached to anything. There's no diet. There's no um, thioester anymore. There's no beta keto groups. It's a very stable molecule. Succinate is exceedingly stable, right? So when this leaves, this is a very favorable reaction. Is it reversible? Yes, right? Because the energy in the GTP is about the same amount of energy as in that succinyl phosphate as in the succinyl CoA. So they're very, very close. The delta G is very near zero. So this is totally reversible. Now the question is, what class of enzyme would you put this in? I'll give you a hint, it is not a redox. We got two more of those to go. But what class of enzyme would you put it in? You already know it's not a transferase, and you already know it's not an isomerase. I said those were the only ones in steps one and two. So which one is this? Ligase? It is a ligase, and it's a very unusual ligase. So if you think about it in both directions, it's still a ligase. So let's think about it in the forward direction. I have a succinyl CoA molecule, I'm cutting it off of its CoA, and at the same time using the energy of that to assemble a GDP and a phosphate. So there's my ligation event. I'm assembling a phosphate, which was not attached to something, to a GDP. In the case of steps seven and 10 of glycolysis, I was also doing this phosphorylation of uh, ADP, but the phosphate was on the substrate already. Here it's not when I start, it's just floating around. I use the breaking of the thioester to attach the phosphate to my substrate, 
making succinyl phosphate, and then do the substrate level phosphorylation by first putting it on the enzyme and then using that to transfer it to the GDP. That's like seven and 10 of glycolysis. So here we're calling it a ligase because initially the two things I'm putting together were not attached to anything else. I've ligated them. It's easier to think about in reverse, right? Here, if you start with the succinate, the CoA, and the GTP, I'm using the hydrolysis of GTP to power putting succinate on CoA. That's easier to, to visualize, right? And that's the way the actual enzyme is named. It's called succinyl-CoA synthetase. It's an enzyme that synthesizes succinyl-CoA. That's the reverse direction. But it's totally reversible, and we can name it that way. We sometimes name it when it's not reversible. But it's named for the reverse reaction. So if you're learning these by their names, don't get this caught up in your head that it's making succinyl-CoA in the forward direction. It's not. It's taking succinyl-CoA and making succinate and a GTP. Okay, so just be careful with the name if you're learning it by the names. So this is our one and only ligase in this pathway of eight. So we had one transferase, we had one isomerase, we had a pair of redox reactions, and now we have our one and only ligase in this pathway. So only three steps to go, and you know two of them are two more redox. So let's move on. Let's talk about reactions six, seven, and eight together because you know two of them are redox already. We take our succinate, we're going to remove a couple hydrogens, a couple electrons and protons, and make what's called fumarate. Okay, so all we're doing is turn an alkene into an alkene in the center. Right? So it actually, it doesn't matter if it's cis or trans, it actually makes trans, but it's irrelevant. We're about to get rid of the double bond anyway. But we're turning a, a single carbon bond into a double bond between carbons. Okay, so that's an oxidation reaction. We're removing a pair of hydrogens, electrons and protons, and making a double bond. How do I know it's not a lyase? If you start counting up the number of changes of bonds, you'll notice there's a difference. There's two fewer bonds to hydrogen and the same number of bonds to oxygen, so that's a redox reaction. Also, a dead giveaway of a redox reaction is FADs and NAD plus is involved. Okay, so this is a redox. We're oxidizing succinate to fumarate. In the next step, we're taking fumarate, adding water, and making malate. That looks a lot like the second half of our aconitate we did back in step two. So this is the lyase, right? It's the one and only lyase in the whole pathway. So we're just hydrating a double bond, which turns it into a secondary alcohol. So fumarate to malate, called fumarase, the enzyme, is just a lyase. Right? It doesn't remove the water afterwards. It's just adding water to a double bond. So that's a lyase. And then finally, we take that secondary alcohol in malate and oxidize it to a carbonyl, a ketone, in oxaloacetate, and we're done. Right, we're right back where we started. I used an oxaloacetate to get started, and I've replenished it, completed the cycle. Okay. So these last three steps are easy to remember if you use the, the acronym OHIO. Right? So it does oxidation, hydration, oxidation, if you misspell OHIO with a Y. Right. So oxidation, succinate to fumarate, hydration, fumarate to malate, and then oxidation again, malate to oxaloacetate. Okay, so these three together finish my citric acid cycle. One thing I want to point out in here is if you look at the whole citric acid cycle again, I'll show you the picture here at the bottom right, there were eight reactions, four of which were redox, and the other four were nothing in common. They were four different types. So we had four oxidation reduction reactions, or oxidoreductases. We had one transferase at the beginning, step one. We had one isomerase, step two. Then three and four were redox. Step five was our ligase, right? Step six was redox again. Step seven was our lyase, where we hydrated the fumarate's double bond. And then step eight was the fourth redox reaction. What class of enzyme is not represented here? There's only one. Hydrolase. hydrolase exactly there's no hydrolase so an easy way to remember all these reactions it seems like a lot there's eight of them i know half of them are redox right away so there's that's four right there four immediately you know the redox can you pick those out of the chart immediately yes look for the nad's and fad's right they stand out of the four remaining reactions none of them are the same type we have a transferase 
an isomerase, a ligase, and a ligase, not necessarily in that order, of course. That leaves one class that is not represented, and you said it was a hydrolase, and we haven't seen any hydrolases yet except in gluconeogenesis. So in all of glycolysis, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, and now citric acid cycle, no hydrolases. Right? So easy way to remember those. There's one of each type except hydrolase. It's the one that doesn't exist here. And then there's four redox. Okay, so looking at the four redox, I have one other question for you. It made three NADHs, and one of them was an FADH2. How do you know when to use which? How do you know when an enzyme is going to use NAD plus versus FAD? And it's a very easy rule to remember, and it works almost all the time. Right? There are very, very few exceptions to it. Right? And we're not even going to cover any in this class. So I want you to follow this rule perfectly. When you're doing a redox reaction, you're taking away electrons. Right? The protons are along for the ride. Right? So you can ignore the protons. We're mainly taking away electrons. From which atoms am I taking those electrons? That's the question. So in the case of uh, reaction six here, say succinate to fumarate. This is a very easy question. From which atoms or which elements am I taking those electrons? Carbon. The carbons, right? The, the protons, the hydrogens are just there. They're going to go along with the electrons. I'm taking the electrons from the carbons, right? From one of them. And the other one's going to form its uh, lone pair. It's going to form the double bond, right? So I'm taking it from carbon and carbon. That's where I'm getting the electrons. Okay, let's move on to reaction eight. I'm turning malate into oxaloacetate. From what elements am I taking the electrons? Turning that alcohol into a ketone. So look at the structures of malate and oxaloacetate. From what elements am I taking the electrons this time? The oxygen. And the carbon. Right? I'm taking it from both of them effectively. So I'm taking it from oxygen and carbon. In this case, I will need NAD+. Right? So the rule here is, if I'm taking electrons from an electronegative atom, which you know they don't want to lose their electrons, they're electronegative, they like them. So if you're taking electrons in a redox reaction from an electronegative atom, then you're going to need NAD+. It doesn't matter if they're both electronegative or not. One could be carbon, one could be oxygen. It could be a pair of oxygens. It could be a fluorine and an oxygen or any combination of O, N, and F with something else. It doesn't matter what the other thing is. I need NAD+. If both things I'm taking it from, like in reaction six here, carbon and carbon, are not electronegative atoms like O, N, and F, then I can use FAD. Okay? And that rule will always work for you. Okay, so if if you look at the redox reaction and you're taking the electrons from at least one of the two is an electronegative atom, like O, N, or F, you're going to need NAD+. If it's not, and it's just a pair of carbons or a carbon and a non-O, N, or F, then FAD will work just fine. Usually we're talking about pairs of carbons. So that rule will always work for you. So you know when to use FAD and you know when to use NAD. Okay. Okay, let's put this together in an analogy for you, and I want to track this through. So I can't take credit, full credit, for this analogy. It was first published by uh, Bernard Brown from Manchester in uh, 1973, and I'm sure he taught this to his class of biochemistry students at the uh, School of Medical Sciences there in the UK. And in his paper when he published this, and I'm sure he taught this for many years before 1973, he finally published some biochemical mnemonics and analogies. And what you see on the right is the entire paper. It's one page, like three quarters of a page. Uh, some references and then some high-tech 1970s graphics. So you can cut it out and see the stereochemistry there. But he came up with this idea of, of an analogy to explain tracking the carbons as a strip tease on a Ferris wheel. So that's totally his analogy. He came up with it. But in the, the paper, which I blew up the text for it there so you could read it, and that's his only statement about it. As he says, students will not forget this because of this analogy. He does not explain it. Now, I'm sure he explained it in his course. 
and all of his students had access to, to talking to him about it, but I wasn't around in 1973, so I never got to experience that for myself. So I think this is what he means by it. So I've interpreted what I think he means by this striptease on a Ferris wheel analogy, and I've put my own ideas into it. So let's start at the top. Uh, it's an up, upside down Ferris wheel. So you get on at the top. So when I say you get on this Ferris wheel, you're going to be tracking the carbons that enter the cycle and the carbons that leave the cycle. Okay. So imagine you're at the top of the cycle here and you're on a Ferris wheel and I give you two new carbons. So let's say it's going to be, uh, I give you a pair of socks. All right? you, we're going to keep this rated PG. All right? So I'm going to give you a pair of socks and you put those two socks on. Those socks represent the two new carbons in green here that are entering the cycle. So you are the oxaloacetate molecule, right? You, you had some carbons already, you were wearing some things, right? And I gave you a pair of socks. That's the two new green carbons that entered this round, okay? So now you're a citrate molecule. You're wearing your socks. As we go around this cycle, you're gonna lose some clothing, right? We're gonna lose some carbons as CO2. So let's move on to oxaloacetate. The wheel's turning. You haven't lost any clothing yet. You still have all six of your carbons. In the next step, the isocitrate dehydrogenase, you're going to lose a carbon, but you will not lose a sock. You notice the carbon that leaves was not one of the two that entered this round. So whatever it was, who knows what it was, all right, some other article of clothing that you already had, it's not a sock. Let's keep that straight, okay? Moving on to the next step, the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, you lose yet another carbon, another piece of clothing, but again, it is not a sock. You still have both green socks. Everybody following that around, okay? Then we do succinyl-CoA synthetase, and here's where we cut the succinate off of the CoA, and at this point, I lose track of your socks. I don't lose any more clothing this round. I'm down to four carbons, but I don't know which carbons are the socks anymore. If you look at succinate at the bottom, it is a totally symmetrical molecule, and it's free to tumble. It is released. Unlike citrate, which was passed along, succinate is released by this enzyme, right? Totally free to tumble in solution in the mitochondria. So I don't know which carbons are which anymore. Which pairs, you can see the multiple choice question, I hope, looking at succinate at the bottom, which pair of carbons are the two that entered this round? Which two are the green socks? Could it be... I'll label them uh, one, two, three, four, top to bottom. Could it be carbons one and two? Could be. It could be, you're right. Could it be carbons two and three? No. No. Could it be three and four? Oh, yeah. Yes, it could be three and four. Could it be one and four? No. Could it be two and four? Yes. So two meaning this CH2 and four, the one not next to it. Uh, no. No. So can you see the multiple choice question? There's quite a few options. The only right answers are going to be the extremes, either the two carbons on this end or the two carbons on the other end because it can tumble. It's one of those pairs, we agree, but we don't know which one. Okay, so that's all we know about your socks so far. So somehow you got tumbled around on the, we don't know where your socks are anymore. So either the top two carbons or the bottom two carbons are the new ones that entered this round. We're going to call those our, our socks. What happens in the next step? We oxidize it to form a double bond. I still know where the socks might be. They're either the top two or the bottom two again. Okay, let's move on. It's still a symmetrical molecule. Then we have fumarase. Fumarase hydrates that and forms malate. Well, malate is no longer symmetrical, but I don't know which pair are my socks still. It's either the top two again or the bottom two. That hasn't changed, but they're not symmetrical anymore. And then finally, I oxidize that to oxaloacetate. And again, I can locate my socks, but I'm unsure which pair it is. Is it the top two carbons or the bottom two carbons? I don't know, but it's one of those options. Everybody follow me so far? That's the first round around the Ferris wheel. Rather simple. Now it's going to be a little more complicated. So you've made it around. I know you're wearing both of your socks at this point. I don't know where they are. You know, who knows? You might have them on your ear or something. But you're wearing two socks, the same two I gave you last round. But now I'm going to give you two more carbons. 
This time I'm going to give you, let's say, a pair of earrings. Right? You put those on. Right? I don't know where your socks are, but you just got two earrings. What can you tell me about your loss of earrings this round? Is it going to happen? As we go around the Ferris wheel this time, are you going to lose any earrings? Think about the last time we went around. I gave you socks. You did not lose socks. I gave you two earrings this time. Are you going to lose any earrings? No. Not this round. Exactly. Are we going to lose a sock? Let's find out because that's our question. So looking at this, it's, I, it's hard to do this without you seeing me draw it on the board, I know. But if you can imagine, look at, look at oxaloacetate. Either the top carbon pair or the bottom carbon pair are the socks. Right? I know you can't see my mouse, but you will when you watch the video. Okay, so I'm adding two more earrings now. The two green ones are my new earrings. Where's the original oxaloacetate atoms? So remember, I, this molecule flipped over on us. So the carbon 1, 2, 3, 4 of oxaloacetate is now 1, 2, 3, 4 upside down. So the one off to the side is number 1, the middle one's 2, the CH2 above it is 3, and the COO minus at the top is 4. Okay, so we flipped it over. But I can still locate my socks. It's either the top two or the middle two now. Right? The bottom two are the earrings I just added. So I can still track the, where the socks might be. It's either the top two or the middle two. We move on to isocitrate. Same thing. The two green ones are the earrings now. The socks from the last round are the top two or the middle two. And now we have something interesting happen. We lose a CO2. Which one did I lose? Well, this one, right? The one off to the side of isocitrate because it was the beta keto one when I oxidized it. Was it a sock? What do you think? It's possible. It's possible. I agree. It's a 50-50 chance it was a sock. Okay, so by the time we get to alpha ketoglutarate, where are my socks? Well, it's either the top two again, right, the COO minus and the carbonyl, or the CH2 that's in black there and the CO2 that left. I could have lost a sock, but I don't know if I did or not. Let's move on to the next step, step and it'll get clearer. In the next step, I also lose a CO2. I lose the number one carbonyl. Oh, sorry, the carboxyl group, right? Was that a sock? What do you think? You still don't really know for sure, but it's possible. It's yeah. also possible, I agree. However, if the, sock, if the CO2 I lost in step three was a sock, the one I lost in step four was not. Because we said it's either the top two or the middle two. And I lose one from each of those sets. I lose the number one and I lose number four from the original succinate from last round. Is that making sense? So if, I, if the CO2 I lost in step three was one of the socks, the one I lose in step four is most certainly not. And vice versa is true. If I lost the CO2 in step three and it was not a sock, the one I lose in step four most certainly was a sock. So by the time I get to succinyl-CoA, right, the two green carbons are the new earrings I added this round. We all agree on that. We're not going to lose those this round. The two remaining carbons that are there, the, the two black ones, one of those is the sock. I don't know which one, but only one of them is a sock now. I definitely lost one sock. I don't know whether you kicked it off on step three or step four, but by the time I got to succinyl-CoA, you only have one sock left. And then I get to succinate at the bottom one more time. Where are the earrings? You can answer that question rather easily, right? It's either the top two or the bottom two again, like we did for last round. Where's the sock? Well, it's one of the other two. I don't know which one. That's all you can say. And by the time I continue and make it my way back to oxaloacetate one last time, I know again either the top two or the bottom two are earrings at this point, one of the other two carbons is a sock, but I don't know which one. And then, of course, we, we do it again. I give you two more articles of clothing. Let's say I give you a, you know, a pair of gloves this time. And we go around it again and again and again. But at this point, I can track you lose one earring this round, and I have no clue where your sock is anymore, or if you're even wearing a sock anymore. 
you lose track of it after two rounds. Okay, so that's I think what he meant by his strip tease on a Ferris wheel. He never explained it, but it's a way of tracking the carbons around the cycle. How we do this in experiment is we actually radio label the carbons, and they noticed that when you radio label the acetyl CoA's two carbons, and you go exactly one round around the cycle, how can you only go one round? Well, you don't give it the last enzyme. Right, so you can't complete the cycle. That I would never lose a CO2 that's radioactive. So the carbons that entered this round do not exit this round. However, the carbons that entered the previous round, exactly one of the two, because I can label one or the other, will leave the next round. That's our socks that leave one round later. And in the next round, you lose an earring. And in the next round, you lose exactly one glove. And you lose track of it after that, the one that remains. So I think that's what he meant by the analogy, and hopefully this little silly analogy will help you remember where the carbons are and how you track them around the cycle. Okay, so let's, our net reaction, let's summarize this real quick. We started with an acetyl-CoA. We did lose two CO2s, and that's why I put my analogy in there before we did this slide. Those are not the same carbons. Right? The two that entered this round are not the two that left this round. But when we write a net chemical reaction, we're not tracking the carbons, we're just saying two entered and two leave, or two left. So three NADs were reduced to NADH, one FAD to FADH2, and we turned one GDP and phosphate into a GTP. We did consume two water molecules, but that's okay, that's when we hydrated it with fumarase, but it's just water. And so two carbon atoms entered as acetyl-CoA, two left as CO2, not the same ones. Right? And we did four pairs of hydrogen atoms leave the cycle, four pairs of electrons leave the cycle in the form of NADH and FADH2s. We made one GTP and we had two water molecules that were consumed when we made citrate and when we hydrated fumarate. Okay? How do we regulate this thing? Of course you're going to regulate it. You can guess when, at which steps you're going to regulate it. It'll be at the irreversible steps. Which ones are those? Well, metabolically, step one, but more importantly, completely irreversible, steps three and four. So compared to glycolysis, we regulated it at not so much step one because we wanted glucose to get phosphorylated. We regulated it at step three and 10. Here, we let step one go again for the same reasons. That we don't want unstable things floating around. And we regulate it at step three and four, just like before. Okay. So, Looking at this regulation, it's kind of like the same chart we saw for glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. Looking at the steps we regulate, we're not going to worry about step one here where we turn acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate into citrate. You notice we kind of just let it go. But we're going to highly regulate it at step three and step four. We've already talked about how ATP will shut it down and a lack of ATP or ADP will activate it. And that's the same thing at pyruvate dehydrogenase which we mirrored above, which was our, our prep or entry into the cycle. Okay, so you can try to memorize all these numbers and terms or, or uh, words on the left here, but just think logically. I want to regulate it at an irreversible step, so PDH and steps three and four here. And when I'm lacking ATP, I want this on because it makes more ATP eventually. And when I have ATP, I want to shut this down. That's all you got to remember. 